How are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm probably more tired than you guys because I just fly through here in a uh, red eye flight. So let's see who falls asleep first. Uh, okay. Um, oops, this is not working. I can just press the space bar. Okay. Uh, all right. So between 1990 and 2006, uh, this is my golden time of playing games. I, 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 I was still in school and grad school. I played a lot of games. Uh, but after that, uh, not so much. Uh, I grew up playing games, and games has you know, some very important uh, you know, meaning to my life. I socialize with my friends through games. I hang out with my relatives through games. And, uh, you know, a lot of my view and value has changed by playing certain type of games. So it's, it's, it, to me, it's my, like my childhood companion. Uh, you know, over the past 20 years, I've seen games change a lot from the original games to, uh, you know, today. Uh, and uh, I remember how I was really kind of scared by playing this game. And, you know, nowadays there's the same version. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel quite different now uh, towards these games. Uh, thanks to the recent explosion of mobile and tablet games, uh, video game is at a, a golden time, right? Every day there's like thousands of new games coming out on these you know, digital distribution platform. You know, back then, you know, every month we might wait for one big release, right? Now it's just that every day you're bombasted with new games. Um, some people think it's great. To me, it's worrisome uh, because a, a lot of my friends who grew up with, with, with me, you know, the friends I, I made by playing games with them, they, they stopped playing games. I was like, well, have you played the, the recent Bioshock game? They were like, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, 40 hours to play. Uh, or I just, it's just, it's just not excites me anymore. And uh, it's for kids. You know, I have a family to run. Or I, I have two jobs. You know, I just don't have time. I heard it's addicting, so I, I'm afraid to play that. Uh, so to me, this thing that I grew up with that I consider as part of my life that's inseparable is abandoned by a lot of my friends in my age. Uh, it's scary to me because, you know, as a game developer, that's all I have. And I don't want to abandon this thing that I, I really cherish. And so, you know, a, a lot of time I was talking to people, why do adults stop playing games? Uh, people say, oh, you know, you just need to make games for mature adults, you know, m more mature content. Uh, you know, but, if you look at mature games in the, in the console game industry, it's mostly for uh, a child in a man's body. Uh, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, while I enjoy reading, you know, like a little fairy tale with a kid, you know, as an adult, I, I want something that's more interesting, like something that's more relevant, something that can touch me beyond just a, a simple story. You know, compared to watching a Saturday morning cartoon, I would rather watch a Pixar film, right? Um, and so uh, people are saying game industry is fine, you know, because, you know, we have billions of people playing games. They have never played these games in the past. They're never gamers, but now they're playing these games. You know, I think, yeah, it's great, but I, I was looking for something uh, beyond just, uh, you know, games that probably invented 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, and meanwhile, all those friends who said they don't have time playing games, they're still reading books, you know. They're still watching film. Uh, they still go to theme parks. Or they're still going to, you know, do all kinds of sports events and social events. It's just not games. It's bizarre. Um, I think what these media, like books or movies or, you know, a park, there's something there that's beyond just the kind of amusement. There's something that adds to our life. You know, it's like if, if I ask you, if you think about all the games you've played, if you can just wipe off the memory, you don't have to remember them, but you can keep 
a few of games, you know, when, when, when you die, you want to keep in your memory, what are the things you want to keep, you know? And it, it has to add something to your life. Um, and I think that's something I want to see in the games. And that's something I want games to become. It's to become something respectable. I think the biggest problem is, yeah, we still play games, but you know, people play Candy Crush. Do they really respect games? <laughs> so uh, that's kind of like my uh, frustration, but I don't know what to do with it. I'm just a student you know, in college, not knowing what I'm going to do in my life. And I had a colleague when studying at USC, uh, you know, study with Tracy. Um, in 2005, I worked on a, a student grant project called Cloud. Uh, it's a game where you play as a child who's, you know, sick in a hospital. He's daydreaming himself, flying in the sky, uh, you know, and making, you know, shapes out of clouds uh, and using the, the weather to uh, claim the pollution. Uh, okay, so we, we just continue from where we was left over. Um, so we were trying to make a game that is not um, kind of what we consider a mainstream games that makes you feel like, you know, make you feel very uh, excited and, you know, stressed. We want to have a game that makes you feel relaxed and healed. Um, so when we put the game out, we have no idea whether this is going to be uh, well received. It's a student game. Um, but to our surprise, we start to receive letters, like emails, from people around the, the world, uh, Japan, Tokyo, uh, you know, from UK. And the most important thing is someone was writing me an email that says, you should tell, tell everybody involved in this game that they're beautiful people. Uh, I grew up my entire life, nobody told me I'm a beautiful person. <laughs> so I was like, wait a second, we've made all these game projects, why is this project so different? Uh, and, and, and I thought a lot about it because initially I just don't get it because the game was not well produced. It crashes a lot and there's a lot of bugs. Uh, and I realized that the only thing that sets this cloud project different from all the other projects we did in the school was that it feels different. There's a new emotion in this game. Um, and which brought me into this perspective looking at games as entertainment rather than a software. Uh, so entertainment is just like, uh, you know, it satisfies our desire. And we have all kinds of desire for food, for water, and we have desire for emotion as well. You know, sometimes you just feel really bored, you want something exciting. Uh, you know, you can probably pick one of these medium to have your entertainment fix. You know, roller coaster is pretty exciting. But there are other times you want to feel, you know, um, differently, you want to be touched, you want to learn something, you want to feel uh, enlightened, and there are other type of uh, entertainment media you can use. Uh, in film, uh, which is a very established, uh, mature medium, uh, entertainment medium now, they, they have divided all the film content into these genres, and if you look at the type of genre like adventure or versus comedy, you can tell the differences on how it makes you feel. Uh, and the size of these genres are the size of the market, like how many people really like to watch like adventure film uh, versus how many people like to watch drama. Uh, and, but I arranged this chart in a way so that from the left to the right, the type of emotion gets more complex. You know, like to the left, it's more simple, more primal, like, you know, like horror film or, you know, like, Adventure, it's, it's very simple to, ex to understand. It's excitement. Uh, it's thrill. But when it comes to comedy or drama, it's more like a cocktail, cocktail of all kinds of emotion mixed together. It has a lot of nuance in it. Uh, and in general, I think people who are older prefer more complex uh, taste, while the younger, gen younger audience like the more simple, direct taste. Um, when we look at Video game genres, you know, as it initially started, all video games considered as arcade. And then over time, you know, there's like strategy games, real-time strategy games, shooter, shoot 'em up, uh, side scrolling, uh, you know, like they are all based on technology innovation. Like suddenly we can do a third person camera, there's a third person shooter versus a first person shooter. Uh, 
they're not really about emotion. So when I was trying to uh, match all the video game content I knew onto the real emotional chart, uh, it's quite interesting to see that we have a lot of similar emotions from an action film that happens in strategy games, you know, a lot of uh, arcade game, or, you know, it's coming back to the mobile games, it feels very action oriented, it's about excitement and, and delight. Uh, most of the console games are, these days are focusing on like narrative about adventures, um, and there's a lot of thriller and horror games. Uh, but you can see basically most of the games are concentrated towards the younger audience, uh, on the complex, the more nuanced games, it's very hard to do, so there's not a lot of content there. And so I always wondered, you know, what, what would be the equivalent of a, you know, Oscar-worthy worth, drama or a video game? What is, you know, a romantic comedy? You know, what's a documentary for a video game? You know, it, it's just like I've never seen something like that. Um, and you know, th that's not really un unusual because in the early days of film when, fil when camera is first invented, you know, the experience is also kind of very primal, you know, very direct, you know, uh, this is a train coming to the train station, which is kind of scary. You know, a lot of people, when they first saw the film, were running out of the theater. Um, so, but as film grow, the audience grow, the filmmaker also grow up. You know, their demands for the type of films and the, the depths of the emotion grow. Uh, and slowly, well, over, you know, 50 to 70 years, you know, film finally grew into what we consider as a mature entertainment medium. Well, a lot has to happen, like accessibility. You know, early on, film was kind of blurry and it's black and white, there's no sound. You know, a lot of technology has to add in so the film become accessible, that anybody can easily uh, consume and, 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 and inter be entertained. Uh, then the, the breadth of the type of emotions needs to grow. A lot of early indie film eventually become mainstream, becomes a new type of genres. Uh, and then depths, you know, like, you know, our desire to consume things just keep growing. You know, it's like, you know, our taste buds is never satisfied. You know, if we have something that is, you know, a uh, hundred percent good, then next year we want something like a hundred one percent. You know. Uh, so, I think in order for a video game to be like, you know, as well received, as well respected like film, I think we need to address all these issues, uh, you know, to, to become a respectable medium. And that is why when we started that game, co that game company, the three things we want to focus on is accessibility, you know, new type of emotion, and making the emotion more, more, more powerful and complex. Uh, so. We had spent the first six years working on three games with Sony, uh, Flow Flower Journey. Uh, when we work on Flow, we mostly focus on accessibility. Um, accessibility was a huge problem. You know, if you were born in the past three or five years, that's not really an issue. But back then, you know, con uh, console controller has more than 16 buttons, and it's just very intimidating for anyone who doesn't play games to try to put it on there. We tried a lot to eliminate these entry barriers. I mean, we're working with, with Sony exclusively, so we, we have to deal with this controller, so we made our game all like one button. Um, so also, rather than requiring people to use two of their thumbs, which is quite a lot of uh, dexterity requirement, we just used the tilt. Uh, that's before there is even iPhone, right? So uh, this is actually a kid who has Down syndrome. Uh, He's not really able to play most of the games because he can't read and understand system, but you know, even, even him can really play and fly in, in flower. Uh, and so Flow, and due to the simplicity, Flow was part of the MoMA's collection for you know, excellence in design, so people can walk into the museum and try it out and don't feel like intimidated. Uh, flower was in the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, and we've seen like, you know, two years old, three years old playing Journey, I, it, it's kind of amazing. I, I don't know how they did it. Uh, and yeah, but, but if, if you are now, today, you know, because, you know, the boom of the mobile computing, everybody's get used to the touch screen. You know, it's not an entry barrier anymore. Everybody knows how to do it. Uh, do we just have all the problems resolved? No. 
Like, if you think about all these apps, you know, how many of them actually is playable by your mom, right? <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't even figure out some of these games sometimes. Um, I think the other big pr problem with accessibility is people think, oh, as long as you put a tutorial, people can play it. But I think there's also accessibility on the emotion. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, you can, you can play a game, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you wanted to play this game. Um, so in order to make a game accessible, I think you have to create emotions that is going to be natural to whoever you wanted to, uh, in, to have to enjoy, to enjoy your game. Um, so when we're working on Flower, we're focusing on the idea is, is it possible to invent a new emotion through video game that is not done in the past? Um, I really like this concept called want versus need. This is a writing concept. You know, when we write film script, we say, oh, a character is not really real if, if what he wants and what he needs is the same, because most people don't know what they want. Uh, don't, don't know what they need. They know what they want, but it's not the same as what they need. And I think it's very true to focus test or you know, marketing research. If you ask a gamer what, they, what do they want, they will just tell you bigger explosion, faster cars, stronger uh, heroes. Um, but instead, if you look at what these people might need or what the market might need, it could be very much the opposite of what they tell you. Uh, what, what about peace? What about relaxation? What about you know, feeling in harmony with nature? Uh, you know, I grew up in Shanghai, you know, which is a great concrete jungle. And when I come to California and seeing the rolling grass hill, I was pretty impressed. I thought this is like the Windows wallpaper. Uh, <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, like if everybody enjoys that, can I actually uh, create an experience which I, I can bring these experience I see being there uh, and share it with people, uh, my friends who's in the city. So I've been thinking about a game where I can combine nature and the urban environment together. Uh, so you know, this is one of the last level where you bring nature into a colorless city and you, you know, bring life and color and motion into uh, the concrete jungle. Uh, but this game seems like very simple, right? There's no character, there's no complex system. It's just basically painting life into the world. It took us two years to make. Uh, the biggest problem when you're trying to make something new is we want a game that makes you feel peaceful uh, and relaxed. But when we add a bunch of uh, very fun, engaging uh, mechanics into the game, uh, we, we hear our testers curse. Uh, you know, just think about this. You know, any kind of fun game that involves challenge has the potential for people to fail. You know, if, if you try to throw a basketball into the hoop and it bounces out. It's barely getting, but it bounces out. It's just frustrating. Um, so we were trying really hard to figure out a gameplay that is fun, but not inducing any kind of that, any kind of that stress. We tried 12 completely different games. It's like taking about a year and a half just to go through all the different interactions until we find one particular gameplay that does not make you feel you know, like you know, like anxiety-inducing. Um, so it's very different from what, how we make games. We spend 75% time on R&D. If this is in a conventional game studio, people will think, like, do you know what you're doing? Right? We should probably cancel your project. Uh, but back then, because this project is small enough, we were just like five people, uh, we will be able to keep it going and eventually break through. Uh, this is a video uh, Mocha was shooting. Uh, they brought it to me because they, they, they're trying to shoot a trailer about video game as an art. Uh, but essentially, they mounted a flower game on top of the camera and have just people playing flower. Uh, to, me, this is, to me, this is a video game designer porn because you get to see how your, your player <laughs> feel. Like, you know, in slow motion, right? And, and it's super focused. And so I was super rewarded just to see how they feel. And it's very different from... Uh, how they play uh, Call of Duty, uh, for example. Uh, yeah, initially, <laughs> anyway, all right. So, and so, you know, after we figure out, okay, you know, to try new emotion is possible, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of R&D, a lot of tr trial and error, um, but we've, we've proven that we could do it. 
And the next thing we wanted to do is, can we create emotion that is you know, more complex and that is deep, that has impact on the player, you know, that can match with a wonderful feel? So when we work on journey, uh, that has been the focus, and particularly like an online game. You know, can we have a strong emotion between two players online? Um, we started Journey in 2009, so that's the year where Farmville is like the most popular game. Do you still remember that game? <laughs> uh, and people are talking about social game is like really this new thing where you can actually uh, socialize by adding your neighbors uh, or maybe sending points to each other. And I was just like, this is a joke because to me, social means emotional exchange, not number exchange. And I wanted to see if I can make a game that creates something that is emotional between people. Uh, and the first thing we do is we look at the market, we look at what's out there, what are the multiplayer games people are doing. They are either about killing each other or killing something together. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you think about most of the console game, where it's coming from is, you know, uh, power fantasy, you know, empowerment and freedom is what the younger uh, male really enjoy. So when you have these characters and when you make them multiplayer, it's naturally competitive. Like a lot of nasty things happens on online uh, uh, competitive games. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you have experienced that. Uh, and we're thinking like in the ideal social emotion, people need to share feelings. So, you know, look, what a wonderful view there. Right? Wow. And so at that moment, these two people are kind of in sync. But the problem is with most game is more like this. Uh, so there's no chance for you to share the emotion. Uh, and most of the games are very busy. You know, it's just like explosions happening everywhere. I wanted to, you know, kind of share a moment with this guy. It's just not possible. So. You know, we, we get rid of all the background noise, and then, you know, also we have to get rid of their guns. Uh, and then, you know, then it becomes a chat room because it, everybody's, like, trying to say something. Um, and we, we wanted to kind of make it more unique, so we actually eliminate more people, uh, put them in a very kind of deserted environment where, you know, for quite a while you don't even see a person. And then when you run into the other player, you're not thinking about how am I going to use my gun to shoot his head. But... You know, oh my God, there's finally a, a person I wanted to, I wanted to see. Uh, so in order to make people connect, uh, we realized um, we shouldn't make people big because when they're big, they're gods. When you put two gods together, they fight. So we want to make people feel small. You know, they have a sense of awe towards the, to, towards the, the world and if they don't know anything. It's kind of like, you know, in New York, if you walk on times you know, Times Square. People are so busy, nobody cares talking to you, right? But if you go to hike, you go to nature where you don't really, you're not really familiar with the environment, there could be potential danger, and you run into a hiker, at least you will say hi, right? And it's just very different emotion. Uh, and we're trying to use all the design elements to, to create feelings between people. And there's a lot of Difficulty because we don't know what that game is supposed to be. I mean, Journey is a three-year three project. Again, we spend a, at least 60% time doing R&D. There's a lot of conventional wisdom about what a good game is, and they, they don't work well with Journey. Uh, you know, conventional online games, you, you think about joining a lobby, finding a server, checking latencies, and getting everybody ready to start a game. This is back to accessibility, right? How, how is my kid supposed to understand how to do that? Or my, my mom understand what is a PIN number? Uh, the other problem is when people have their names, you know, they bring part of their real life into the game. And a lot of time these names and IDs are distracting. They're taking you out of the game. And for a journey, we want you to be in there so you care about each other. And you're, you're that character, you're not you. Uh, so we, we eliminate all the, the logging, all the, the PSN ID. We even don't have friends invite, which is quite contradictory to like what people think will make your game sell better. Um, and yeah, I mean, you just run into people and you, you travel together. Uh, if you don't like each other, you walk away from each other. Everything's organic. It's all about bringing you into the world so you can feel something. Um, sometimes you have to fight against player's nature. Uh, I have all the good intention for the people to help each other, 
So uh, initially in the game, uh, player can pass each other without any colliding because you know collision is difficult to write. Uh, so uh, one day I, I was very excited. I told my team like, imagine if the two people can help each other to climb up a rock. Right? This is a sequence. Uh, so I can pull you up. I can I can push you up. You know, with all these physical contact, you will feel more intimate with each other. This is going to be a great idea. It's going to make people care each other more. So, you know, like in some extreme case, our artists paint this thing, and, you know, you have to kind of rely on each other to get something. But what happened in the real world is people realize they can push each other, then they start to push each other into something dangerous, and, you know, <laughs> they kill each other. Um, and the funny thing is, like all the online games, you know, if your friend dies, they just kind of dies there, and the, you kind of go to, wake, uh, to, to kind of bring them back. So what happened is, initially, our playtester is doing that. I'm just like, these guys, they're just, you know, they're just like basically griefers. You know, they play too much Call of Duty. So they're a bad person, right? But then this is happening among our coworkers. And I was like, we all know this game is supposed to be helping each other. Why are they doing this? Uh, and later on, I get to talk to a child psychologist, and she was telling me, you know, basically, you're dealing with babies. You know, when they enter the virtual world, it's not a reality, so they don't carry their moral code into a virtual space. And when a baby was born, baby look for maximum feedback. Um, if you kill the person, there's blood stains, right? There's social anxiety because he's waiting for you to save him. Right? There's so much feedback by killing them than just pushing them away. So, of course, everybody would like to kill each other. Uh, you know, and so... The, the way we have to work against what we think the player is, is is by controlling what kind of feedback we provide and you know, minimizing the feedback of things we don't want them to do and maximizing the feedback we want to encourage them to do. So the final game is people don't really collide with each other, but if they, they get close, uh, they both get energy or you know, like currency in the game where it lets you fly. So now everybody can fly when they find someone and then they're happy to see each other. You know? <laughs> And uh, before, they would really hate each other. Um, so, you know, these are the things we have to do a lot of trial and error to figure out. You know, it's just not very intuitive. And it's, it could be very expensive to make these games just because how many mistakes you will make. Uh, I also want to talk about the, the emotional depth. Uh, Cassasis is a term that, you know, to describe a emotional a strong emotional uh, experience where it's so strong that it, it, it flush your senses. Um, in Hollywood, when we want to create an emotional climax, we arrange a three-act structures. So, uh, you know, you start kind of going up. If the movie just keeps going more intense and more intense, eventually you, you build up your threshold, you kind of don't feel anything. Uh, so in order to make people feel a drastic rise in the end, uh, we have to have the second act have a twist so the story goes kind of to the opposite direction and then in the end you have a dramatic lift and that's usually when the catharsis happens. Uh, and I believe catharsis is the key to make games more meaningful beyond just, you know, uh, kind of a distraction. Uh, because after catharsis, because the emotion is so strong, people inevitably have to think, sec think twice about what they've just experienced. Just the fact that the ex emotional experience make them think again is a wonderful thing. Uh, so for us, in order to make the catharsis strong, we were using uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, The Hero's Journey. Uh, if you learn story writing, this is like must, must learn. Uh, if you're a game designer, probably you learned that too. Uh, we apply Hero's Journey, journey uh, religiously. Uh, to create a storyline of uh, journey, uh, we arranged everything uh, that will happen on their path. The hero's journey is essentially a universal story among all the mystical uh, story uh, and folklores that people tell around the world uh, about transformation lives. Uh, we use the arc, we design the world to follow the arc. We, you know, we have the character to grow from a young character to an old character and eventually die and transcend. So it's like the transformation of a lifetime. And then we, based on uh, these emotions, we create the, uh, the color tunes 
We design all the levels. Even the elevation is kind of following the three X structures. Uh, and eventually we break it down into details and you know, have all, all the gameplay elements like the sound, the visual, uh, you know, and the gameplay, they all work together. Just like how you would direct a film, like all the elements has to sing the same notes to make uh, the impact strong. And the most difficult part is again, gameplay, because you know, we know how to make a gameplay fun, but do we know how to make a gameplay feel twisted or sad or you know, like depressing? You know, that's really against our nature as a game designer, like how to design interaction like that. Um, so when we launched Journey, I'm, I'm not gonna show the trailer, uh, but we launched it in March 6, 2012, and that day we launched on our company forum, people start to apologizing for leaving the game too early or you know, left the, the other person behind because they don't know who they are. So they have to come to our forum to leave this you know, uh, apologize thread. Hopefully the guy will see it, which we, we, we thought, wait a second, aren't these guys the, the griefers, you know, the, the assholes from playing Golf Call of Duty? And you know, they're, still, they're doing it. It's, it's kind of amazing how like, by changing the design, they are, they are behaving quite differently. Uh, in Journey, if you keep playing, your appearance becomes more and more senior. Uh, so we see a lot of fan art um, and screenshots. You know, there are a lot of very uh, elite players. They are they keep playing the games for you know hundreds of times because they wanted to help other people uh, to lead them. And they are very patient because a lot of new players, they don't know what to do, and they, they will actually you know, patiently wait them and guide them. It's really just incredible to see what happens in the game. Uh, these are other fan art people remembered you know, you know, during the young time. It's a beautiful thrill uh, ride. And then you know, in the mid-age, there was a time where they lost uh, the, 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 uh, the veteran players protecting the young. Uh, or they're relying on each other in the snow when they get older uh, and when they're about to die. Uh, a lot of people, when they reach the end of the game, they leave a footprint in the snow to uh, show hearts or maybe say goodbye uh, to each other. Uh, recently, I've seen people doing four hearts. Uh, and so Journey has won a lot of awards. You know, it's cool. It's very encouraging and to see you know, uh, our game is being recognized by, by like the mainstream, like, you know, flow, uh, Flow in MoMA and Flower in Smithsonian. And uh, Flow uh, Journey was like the first nominated soundtrack for Grammy, uh, which we thought this is really awesome. Uh, and a lot of mainstream media reported about Journey. Um, but I think, you know, when these happens, we don't know what to react. We, we feel very grateful, uh, but out of everything we've seen after we released Journey, uh, we still prefer the letters from the player the most. This is the most direct feedback as a designer. Uh, we started that game company because fans write letters to us and they're telling us we need to build a company to show the world that games like this are, they do exist. Uh, and uh, when I go through the letters, there's over a thousand letters for, uh, from Journey fans. Uh, and so I, I want to pick a few of them that is kind of surprising, that, that was not expected from us um, to share with you. So the first one is about near-death simulation. Uh, so this, this guy sent us a letter that says, you know, when I was 10 years old, I got into a horrible hunting accident and died twice. And for a total amount of about 15 minutes, I was considered as dead. Uh, but with my two deaths experience, I've had in my life, I've never really found any form of media that could explain how it feels to be in your own out of body experience. Uh, but the final level of journey nailed it. And the sense of wonder and freedom and beauty that I experienced in the last level brought me back to the 11 years ago uh, when this accident first happened. I've never experienced death. I was just like, whoa, really? Did I just make that happen? <laughs> what a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, okay, the sec second one is uh, from a, a war veteran, you know, therapy, therapy for hope. So he said, okay, this is a little bit long because I didn't cut too much. Uh, he said, I'm a disabled combat veteran living with a traumatic uh, brain injury 
that gives me memory cognitive problems. I also have back, neck, knee damage, and over the last week was diagnosed with a kidney stone and possibly Crohn diseases. Uh, plus the usual round of PTSD most veterans possess. I've been in a lot of pain and I'm not particularly happy. Last night, which I noticed it's uh, the night before Christmas, uh, <laughs> I played your game. I took maybe one break during the game. I woke up today and I felt better. I'm still a bit sore from the kidney stone, but I felt better about my life and about the choices I've made that have left me here. I'm not a doctor or psychologist, but I know when something convinces me that everything is going to be all right and refocuses on my life away from the pain and to the things that matter. I have a wonderful family, a loving girlfriend, and a new baby on the way. I'm happy again and more appreciative today. Someone did this. Someone over there made my life better through the creation of this game. Someone over there deserves my gratitude in a grand way. Thank you. This game is a therapy. It really is. And I, I was really moved while I read it, but I totally didn't plan this game to be a therapy. And, and the fact he could see hope playing through, through this game, it, yeah, it was not intended. We were just thinking about creating a strong emotional impact. What they got out of the game is not in my control, but it is really awesome to know that the game can actually do that. Uh, so I also got about you know, five or six people writing to me, uh, telling me about the same story which is about losing their uh, family members or their close friends. Um, so uh, this is actually from a developer, uh, a game developer. Uh, he said, only hours before I was able to call him back, I received word from my, that my dad had suddenly passed away. You know? And one of the biggest regrets he had is that he was not able to, to hear his voice on, on the last time. And then when he played Journey, uh, you know, as strange as it sounds, it allows him to play, uh, to, 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 to run into an online stranger. And because the way the stranger played with him, it felt like the stranger is taking care of him, is leading him and is guiding him and being patient with him. It's just like his, his dad. And somehow by going through the game together and seeing uh, the player coming back, uh, you know, being with him, walking all the way into the light, he felt he was able to put it down. Uh, and you know, it, it's just very strange that how could this be possible? Like how could, could he consider an online player as his parents? Um, which is totally not you know, like what I planned, but there's like five or six people have similar experience. Uh, I've shared this story before uh, in the other conference, but I, I still really find it important to me because that that keeps me excited to go to work every day. Uh, this is from a 15 years old uh, girl called Sophia. Uh, she said, your game pa practically changed my life. It was the most fun I had with him, which is her dad, since he had been diagnosed. My dad passed away in the spring of 2012, only a few months after his diagnosis. Uh, weeks after his death, I could finally return myself to play uh, video games. I tried to play Journey, and I could barely past the title screen without breaking down into tears. In my dad's and in my own experience with Journey, it was about him and his journey to the ultimate end. And I believe we encountered your game at the most perfect time. I want to thank you for the game that changed my life, the game whose beauty brings tears to my eyes. Journey is quite possibly the best game I've ever played. I continue to play it and always remember what joy it brought and the joy it continues to bring. Uh, I'm Sophia, I'm 50, and your game changed my life for the better. And that is the kind of thing I mentioned earlier. I, I wish video games is, is, is something like that, something that makes people's life for the better. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the future of the game. Uh, so when people ask me about the future of emotions and future of games, storytelling, people first think about all these new technologies, oh, the game's going to look more real, we're going to capture all the, the actors' performance, uh, you know, like minority, minority Report is now totally, you know, possible, and with the augment, uh, virtual reality, we're going to just be more involved into this uh, experience. 
But to me, these things doesn't matter. They are just tools. They make the experience slightly more intense, but they are not changing the feeling. The future is not here. In the future of game de developer is still creating emotion. It has never changed. You know, it might be on a new platform. It might be having a, a, you know, a 3D vision. But in the end, we're telling stories. Uh, and when it comes to stories and emotion, how is the future going to change? I think the mainstream has changed. Because back then, when we think about video game five to 10 years ago, we think about about 260 million console players. And they are the mainstream. They generate most of the revenue. And they are mostly young men. Um, but today, we have 10 times more device than consoles out there, the smartphones, the tablets, everywhere. We got 2 billion people who is capable of playing games, and they all play some sort of games. And the mainstream today is not the young man anymore. It is basically everybody, maybe minus my parents' generation, uh, my grandparents' generation. Um, and you know, right now, um, Mobile device is something that I find it's quite interesting because you know, like older people, younger people, they all kind of grew up with it. You know, like the kids today are more in tune with touch interface than, than the controller. And to them, the controller seems to be alien, um, and it's literally everybody. You know, like in the family, the the dad, the mom, the kid, the, the grandparents can even play Angry Bird. Uh, my friend's mom is 94 years old and she plays all kinds of games every day on, on her iPad. Um, what I want to talk about in terms of emotional market, I want to bring back to the film industry. Uh, we all know film, you know, a lot of like Hollywood blockbuster film makes a lot of money. Action adventure is making more money than other genres. But if you look at the growth uh, of all the films added together, you realize that action is not the most popular film. And adventure isn't the, the second most popular film either. Uh, it's, it's like comedy is quite a huge market, and drama is as well. Uh, just like the pie chart I showed you earlier. Uh, this is a kind of a gender and age distribution in terms of their preference towards uh, different movie genres. Uh, to the left, the blue section, uh, this is what men like. And uh, to the top is younger age, uh, and uh, to the bottom is older age. And you can see basically what men like in film has all been already turned into a video game. You know, action, adventure, thriller, horror, comic book based content. But on the other side, you know, I mentioned earlier, what is a romantic comedy? You know, we have all these women playing games, but they are only playing, you know, basically match three games. Like, what kind of emotion can we provide for all the women out there that, it, that was not originally a game player? You know, can any of this emotion be turned into a video game? And also in the center area, you know, well, both men and women like, you know, comedy, art, you know, art film or drama, fantasy film, animated film. Like, what are the equivalents of that in, in video games? Um, I think in the future, there will be more complex and nuanced emotions. You know? And I think games needs to also make people think and see the world in a different perspective. Games has to touch people's heart to reach catharsis. Games has to connect people and bring them closer, just like how it feels like going to a theme park or you know, a bar or a club or going to play golf together. And all these things games can do. And I just think they are not enough today. And it has to be more, because all these people, you know, in all ages, all the genders from all around the world will play games, and they need these content. Um, is there a game can, in, you know, involve the whole family to play? Because right now there's like kids games, like Club Penguin. Uh, there are adult games, but is there a game where adults and kids can play together and they can enjoy it together? I couldn't think of any. Um, you know, we talk about memories. I was mentioning this idea earlier. Like, if you die, you, you can carry a certain memory with you. What would you carry with you? Right? If you pick, you know, a book, if you pick, you know, an animated film or a, a theme park, 
you know, there are things that I would, I would want to remember for the, for the, for the rest of my life. Um, but what is that, the, the same version for interactive entertainment? What is the game that you want to carry with you to, you know, even if you lose all the other memories? And I think there's a lot of things we can do here as game developer. And the only way we can do that is by putting our heart into it. And then we may turn video gaming into something respectable. And thank you. <laughs>